Yeah, welcome. Uh, we are we are uh, starting off. I guess we're going to call this lesson two uh, uh, yeah. of our our foundations course, which I guess is, is is sort of what we're doing here. I don't know if if it's really a course or a a stream series or whatever we want to call it. Um, uh, but but welcome. Uh, as always, I'm David Cohn. Um, I'm uh, heading up uh, engineering education here at Timescale. Um, we're doing this course as a way to, to help give people a, a foundation in uh, in sort of what they need to know around Postgres uh, and timescale. Um, and yeah, that's the that, that's the basic just there. Um, uh, and yeah, so uh, other than that, let me introduce Miranda. Uh, Miranda's uh, with us, or I'm going to actually just say, Miranda, you should introduce yourself. Uh, <laughs> As usual, for those of you who are back, you, you know her already, but... Uh, yes, yes. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Um, yep, as David said, I'm Miranda All. You probably may know me. I don't know. Or you don't know me. Who knows? Um, yep, I, so I'm a developer advocate here at Timescale. Um, and kind of my role in this is that I get to learn alongside all of you, which is very exciting. And um, so I will ask questions, but I also really, really want to be here so that I can help facilitate asking your questions to David or just, you know, whatever we want to discuss. So please definitely put in your questions uh, throughout the talk, like, or really just discussion and learning session. I, it's really not a talk. It's more, it's more interactive. So <laughs> yeah, add, add your questions. I'll ask questions. We'll all have questions. Um, and David can be our awesome source of knowledge. So <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, and yeah, so, so, uh, I'm going to start today. I don't have a fun scenario, unfortunately to start today, but, um, what I wanted to start off today was sort of going over some of the, the homework from last time. So if you remember from last time, uh, did you do your uh, homework? Yeah, who knows? Uh, <laughs> I didn't do the homework. I'm, um, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so we worked. We worked through the uh, a scenario where where you started off as the inventory manager and then sort of built up a database around it. Um, and we said that the homework for that was going to be sort of go through the go through that example and make your own version, which hopefully made you like maybe install Postgres uh, and figure out how to connect to it in some way. Um, Right. Uh, maybe you learned how to create tables. Um, uh, maybe you ran some queries against those tables. Um, and so I was sort of wondering if there are any questions now uh, from that. Uh, um, if you do have questions, I, please put them in the chat now. Or, you know, as as people post questions, we're happy to try and answer them even a little later. Um, so, but we do want to also see if you know pe people want to come during this time. It's going to be every two weeks at two thirty. Um, we are happy to actually answer some questions live if, if you have them. Um, so, uh, but I know that, that a fair number of people are just watching this later, so you may not be able to do that. Uh, but feel free to post questions also on the old videos. Um, we also are going to have some things in a forum maybe for, for, for this week. So this week, um, our lesson for lesson two, and of course, as usual, I forget to update the date because uh, I give this internally and then I give it externally <laughs> and I forget to update the date. Uh, three for three. So pretend that first is 10th. Uh, this is probably just going to keep happening, folks. Um, so we'll, we'll start like, off I'm again. I'm just going to keep a tally. I'm just going to keep yeah. a secret. <laughs> <laughs> One day I'll remember. And then well, the following exactly. I'll forget again and I'll just give up. I'm, uh, I'm going to have like, I'm going to be ready with like a, like, I don't know, like those, those poppers that like explode and like have confetti and stuff. I'll be ready for that. <laughs> I'm going to get one right now. And for the day that you remember, we'll just have a party. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we, we may be here a while. Um, so this time I wanted to start. So last time we sort of started from this, like, okay, you are, you are the inventory manager. You have to figure out how to like design a database um, or you're really, you know, not experienced with databases at all. And so uh, talking about just how the sort of normal actions of a job, actually you sort of are implicitly creating a database. Um, here, I want to start from the other end because this is the other way that people encounter, I think, um, databases. And this is maybe in some ways more common. So 
you get your a new role and you're the data analyst. Sweet. And so now you're looking at a database and you're like, okay, well, what the heck is here? Right, you need to start thinking about how you might ask questions of it. Hmm. Um, what we're gonna use is a lovely demonstration database that um, uh, the Postgres error database that uh, uh, Hedy Dumb Dumbroskaya, I think that's her last name and I'm probably pronouncing everything horribly, so don't, sorry, um, uh, created. Um, uh, and, and, and it's a, it's a lovely, lovely demonstration data set that has some really, really nice stuff in it. Um, we would love some more demo data sets, or if you want to work on your own project, I think that's a really good way to learn, um, is to have some sort of data set that you're exploring yourself, something that, that is meaningful to you, um, or that you need to do, or there's a question that you want to, that you want to answer. Um, okay. so we want to get to the point where we can write some queries to ask a question that we're interested in. That would be lovely if we can get there today. I don't know how far we're gonna get today. Um, but uh, so I wanna think about how we explore a data set, understand a few concepts around it, think about some documentation or how we might read the documentation. And the homework is like write a query, either about this data set, about some other data set, um, or you know, tell us something you learned as you were trying to explore this data. So that's really, what I want to get to today, um, or even if you can just come up with a question, right? Maybe you don't know how to write the query to answer a mm -hmm. question, but as you look at the data in this data set, what questions come to mind? And then we can figure out how to translate that into SQL later. So those are some of the things that I would love for you to be thinking about as we go through this. Um, uh, one thing to note here is, the other thing that I wanted to do with this lesson is be mostly practical. There's going to be, I'm going to spend a little bit of time in slides, but I have like, I don't know, a quarter of the slides that I might normally have, not have, not even. Um, and then we're just going to hop over to PSQL. I'm trying this out. It might mean that it's a little bit disjointed, that we sort of skip around a little bit more uh, because it's just a little bit harder to structure that. Um, it might mean that you know, I, I think that hopefully Miranda is going to ask some more questions here, um, putting on her beginner's mind hat, which is, I, I really love that you're doing that. It's, uh, it's so incredibly helpful for me. Um, and uh, then also, I think the, um, it, but, but part of this is also just so you can see a little bit of how I work with something because it's, it can be really useful, I think, to just see how people work on a thing. Like, what do they do? What's the, what's a typical type, type of workflow? How can, you know, and, and to be honest, I'm going to be doing this in PSQL. I only use PSQL some of the time. I also often use some of the graphical interfaces. I'll briefly show that. I'm going to use PSQL um, partially because it's a very common one and my graphical user interfaces are more Mac based. So I don't want to do something that's really specific. Um, but there are lots of different ways to do this. Um, so I just wanted to show one way of doing it so that you just get a feel for how that might work. Um, so with all that said, we're going to start off with a couple of concepts that I think are going to be useful. Um, oh, uh, and, as, and yeah. um, it might be helpful just to recap on what PSQL is, just like a Brief recap. Great idea. We're gonna we're gonna do that. It's a command line tool to okay. use for accessing a database. Hopefully, you've connected to the to the database somehow. However, you want to connect, though, you can use PSQL. Is usually the common way that people uh, connect to Postgres. Um, but we're gonna go over that in a sec. For now, I wanted to just quickly do a couple of quick concepts that might be very helpful, and then we're gonna go into connecting to to Postgres and just you know actually type in some stuff. So. The first thing I want to cover is schema versus schema, which may sound weird at first, um, but this is one of those words where we often use it differently um, in different contexts inside of Postgres or inside of SQL generally. Um, so let's look at what 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 it means. Um, it can mean sort of two different things at least. Um, so the first one is the organization or layout of your data and how it relates, and sometimes the DDL defining that. So you might see that as something like what we did last time where we created a, a, a schema, meaning we created the way that our data was going to be laid out. We, we did the DDL. So in this case, 
you could call this schema definition. Um, hey, Fabrizio. Um, Hello. Uh, right. Uh, and uh, so, so you could call this a schema definition. Um, and and just like so, we're clear. Like this is that's one way of referring to schema. But then there's an and 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 you could also think about something like this, which is a little more complex. Like this is the entity relationship diagram. So this it would be the schema. Uh, or the way the data is laid out for this actually this Postgres error um, uh, uh, data set. Um, so they provided an entity relationship diagram. We're not going to go into exactly how to read this right now. Um, that's probably something for a future lesson. Um, but that could be one way that we that we talk about a schema, like it's it's how the data is laid out and how it relates. Um, but then it can also be a namespace. So that is, it's, it's really a part of the database hierarchy that can be used to distinguish different objects. So I just wanted to go over that because sometimes we use schema in these two different ways and it can be confusing to people because we talk about schema definition and whatever else. And then they're like, wait, is it actually in a schema? Like meaning the database hierarchy thing, meaning the namespace. Now, I don't know why they didn't just call it namespace for goodness sake. Uh, uh, you'd have to ask the C standard committee, committee but so we know sometimes we mean two different things here. So what does, what does this type of schema look like? Right, we can say, so first off, you'll see that that command in PSQL slash DN is describe slash D. And I'm going to say, by the way, all the time here, it's a backslash. I'm not going to say backslash because that is, just takes too long. I'm sorry. So understand that if I'm in PSQL, I almost always mean backslash. Um, <clears throat> Because that's how PS commands start. So backslash D means describe. Describe and then N stands for namespaces. And so this tells us these are the namespaces or the schemas that we have. So I didn't again, actually know that's what DN stand for. Describe namespaces. I always find figuring out what the things actually stand for is, is really <laughs> helpful. Because uh, otherwise I cannot remember them for the life of me. So uh, it is, I, yeah, it's a little bit weird. I was like, really? This is how you <laughs> get it? Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So so uh, so schemas, namespaces, the other way that you, 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 this is how you'll see it if you if you do slash DN um, in PSQL or describe namespaces in, in PSQL. Um, if you uh, do this in uh, other places, you'll see that it, it sort of corresponds to a folder in like a file system. So some graphical user interfaces, this is from Postico, which is the one that I use, um, use a folder representation to, just, to, 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 to sort of graphically represent a schema. And you'll see that if I expand that, if I were to expand that, you would see the tables underneath that schema. Um, right, so the tables live inside the schema. You cannot nest schemas, just so you know. You can't nest namespaces like you can nest folders. Um, it's just one level of hierarchy there. And we'll go over a little bit why, kind of. Um, by default, things exist in the public schema, and that's automatically in your search path. We're not going to talk about search path right now um, uh, because that gets a little bit complex, and I just honestly don't want to go into it. So we're going to do some schema qualification and other sorts of stuff in a minute. Um, you'll also see things about the catalog and the information schema, right? So when we looked at this, you see the PG catalog and you see the information schema. Those are where Postgres stores some information about what's actually in the database and can be very useful in learning how to query them. It can be really nice to find out what's going on. It's also how this graphical user interface or how uh, PSQL like knows what these are. They're querying a list of like a table to catalog that they know exists, so they don't have to ask, do these tables exist? Because they always exist on all Postgres instances. So it can query it and figure out what's there and figure out what else to look for. But it uses the same SQL to do that. And I can show you some more about that at some point. Anyway, so uh, the other thing that you should know and some of the relationship to timescale is we use schemas for a lot of different things inside of Timescale. So when you install Timescale DB, you'll actually see in, in Timescale DB Toolkit, you'll see that we create some schemas. There are, there's a catalog schema, right? There's a, a config and an internal schema. We also have these experimental schemas and an information schema. So the information schema is sort of similar to the information schema in Postgres, where it gives you a, uh, 
nice user-facing interface to learn about some of the objects in your timescale uh, database. Um, at the internal schema, we store some stuff in. We can go over more of that when we get to timescale, but I just wanted to say, we're gonna relate this back to timescale. And, and, and part of the reason that I wanted to cover this is that we use schemas pretty heavily in timescale DB uh, to do some of this sort of stuff. So cover that later. We'll go into more of that later. Um, for now, what I wanna do is learn some PSQL terminology and explore our schemas of both kinds. Um, we're gonna learn a little bit about schema qualification and dot notation. Um, we're gonna look a little bit at the Postgres documentation, right? So again, trying to give you a an overview of how I work and learning to read the Postgres docs is really important if you wanna learn how to use Postgres. Um, so we're gonna go over a little bit of that. Um, we'll see what exactly we get to, but uh, and I'm sure that we'll cover some more of that uh, later, later in the course as well. Um, and uh, then we're going to go over a little bit of data types and nulls and other types of constraints, um, which is really coming from exploring what information is given to you as you start looking at how a table is defined. Um, so you can begin to learn then how that helps you relate it to other tables and, and things like that. So with that, getting out of this. And, to PSQL. Full screen, and we're going to go over to PSQL. Um, cool. So I'll just make that bigger. And great. Now we are in your terminal. You are connected. Are you connected already? Yeah, I'm yes, not yet connected, connected. Uh, here. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah. So ah, there it, we go. Leave, okay. it, leave it clean. <laughs> uh, oh, can you make it bigger? Can you make the text? Can I make it bigger? Any I so. bigger. Is that better? Uh, maybe a little bit more. A little bit more. Perf. I feel like that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good? <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. Uh, so if I connect, right, I can connect to PSQL. I can just say PSQL. And that's going to do some default things. Right Right now, I'm just connecting to my local database, um, which is, in this case, my and, and I'm doing the default, which means I connect as my user at, to a database that is my username, which happens to be David Cohn. Um, so if you didn't know my name was David Cohn. Now you do, uh, even though it shows up right there on my picture. Um, uh, anyway, so I can connect that way. Um, uh, you'll see, by the way, uh, I wanted to show you, by the way, that the heady, the the Postgres Air. Uh, let me switch to that. Um, just quickly to show you. Um, so this is the Postgres Air database, uh, demo database that I was talking about. Um, if you are looking to, so, so as you are thinking about um, sort of doing the homework and what we're going through, this can be a useful thing for you to take a look. There's dumps, uh, database dumps. So that's a way of saying it's the data. Um, and there's a link to that. You can go to the Google Drive link. They didn't want to store that inside of GitHub, which makes sense. Um, and you can download that. I I just would say for now, so you don't have to deal with uh, PG Dump and PG Restore, which are backup and restore tools. Just download the the .sql file, and then you can just run that uh, in your Postgres instance um, uh, via PSQL. And so what I did to do that is uh, you can either do slash ir which is, uh, oh God. Um, Quiz time, IR. Oh man. Uh, anyway, I don't remember. It's it's a read, I think it's read and it is, or no, sorry, include relative. Include relative, slash IR just, is include relative. You, um, you passed, I just looked it up. By the way, if you're looking at the PSQL <laughs> commands, um, if you wanna see them, you can do slash question mark. Um, and it'll give you some of the PSQL commands. Uh, so anyway. Uh, I use that all the time because I so. often cannot <laughs> remember this. Um, uh, I don't want to note. Why did you? Anyway, whatever. Um, uh, let me actually, I'm going to quit. So slash Q gets you out of PSQL if you ever in trouble with that. I'm going to clear my screen. Um, and we're going to go back into PSQL. So the other, well, I should, shouldn't have done that. The other thing you can do is you can connect directly to a database. So in this case, uh, I'll show you how to what's the database. But I have a database for this called PG Air, right? Um, and I can correct, connect directly to the database like that. Or I could do PSQL-D, which is stands for database, PG Air. 
right? I connect then directly to the database. If I wanted to see the other databases, um, and remember, whenever I'm quitting this, slash Q for quit, um, I think you can also just type quit, so you know. Anyway, uh, okay, so psql.gpg error, useful to know. If I want to see the other databases, I can always do slash L, which is list, um, which tells me the databases that exist. Okay, so, uh, and there are different template databases and other stuff. You don't need to know about them for now. Um, for right now, what we're going to see here is just our uh, PG Air database. Um, and I think I'm going to move this over here because my name is otherwise covering the where I'm typing. Um, so I'm just going to move that and maybe make this slightly smaller so that we don't end up going off the side. I'll have to look at if there's a, a way to there's like. probably a way to like change where that yeah. overlay is, but whatever. Um, so anyway, we'll have to look for into now, that. Um, okay, so we're connected to our PG Air database. If I wanted to load up uh, something from, this is the other way that I can do it. I can just make it a little smaller. Okay, so if I wanted to load up that file, I can do slash dash D for database, PG Air. So I want to load it into the PG Air, and I can just say dash F, which is run this file, and then the path to my file. So it might be, oh, whatever. Uh, uh, Postgres pair.sql. I'm not going to run this because I've already done that. And also, I don't think that's where my file actually lives. But you get the idea. That's how you can load up this database if you want to get started. And just out of curiosity, um, this database, like the, uh, the data, where, so it's coming from the link that you showed. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly is in it? Just as like for some reference. You'll see. Like what kind of data? Oh, okay. Okay. We'll so it's it. it's airplane flights. It's it's about airplane oh, flights okay. and 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 that's yeah that it's it's Postgres Air is about airplane flights. It's not like air quality. It's uh, airplane flights if that helps, um, okay. which is some useful publicly available data that is relatively understandable I think for folks. Um, okay. An idea of some of this the 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 physical stuff that it's modeling, um, which is always useful. So. We get this, we get into this database and we're like, okay, so what's there? And you might know that the, um, so again, in PSQL, the, the describe command slash D describe, and you could try to find the tables. So slash DT. Um, so there's a table called foo, uh, but I don't think that's what I actually wanted. That's in the public schema. And you'll note though, that if I list my schemas, so describe namespaces, I'll, I have these Postgres error schemas um, and a Postgres error no index. That's something that I, I built for later um, where I basically just restored a, the, the, the database without any indexes so that eventually maybe we could demonstrate uh, why indexes are useful. Um, but that's something we can do later. Um, for now though, let's just see what's in the Postgres error schema. So, and this is where we should talk about uh, dot notation. So in general, whenever you have a descriptor in Postgres, you have um, something dot something else. We talked about it a little bit last time uh, where we talked about how you could do like select and we have this table foo, right? Star from foo, um, like that tells me what's there, but then, and there's nothing here, right? It's just a demonstration table, but I could do select foo dot ts from foo, and that would give me the, that column. So that dot notation is saying from this more general thing to a more specific thing. In general, that's what dot notation does. And so it's the same thing for, um, uh, for schemas. So they're more general than tables. The namespace is more general than the table that's in it. So if I want to select from a table inside, I need to use that dot notation. Or if I want to describe tables inside, I need to use that dot notation. So if I want to see the tables in the Postgres error schema, I do slash DT, so describe tables. And um, then we say Postgres error dot star. And that's going to tell me the tables that are in the Postgres error schema. Cool. So that's a good starting point. So now, I, and this is, again, um, 
so so if I want to then know a little bit more about a table, or I want to like, let's talk about a little bit more about schema qualification and other sorts of stuff. So the other thing that you might want to know about this is that it turns out I can get very specific with my like dot notation and other sorts of things like this if I want to. It's always about going from general to specific. So I can even start with a database, right? So I could say, um, I know this is in the PG Air database, or let's let's select something from this account. We'll do a limit. So select uh, star from Postgres Air dot account limit ten. And I feel like a helpful way that I kind of think about it too is that like you're almost you know similar to a file path on your computer, right? you're like specifying, you know, this folder, like this object is inside of this folder. So kind of like the, the table, this account table is under the Postgres air schema. So it's almost like you're it's like a file path, but with using dots. Yeah. And, and, and it's the same sort of thing. If I wanted to do this in the, like in the select list, if I want to get a specific uh, column here, I can say select Postgres air dot account dot uh, account ID or let's do login login from Postgres air dot account oh and now I got everything I need to remember to do a limit otherwise we're going to be here forever there's a lot of rows <laughs> limit ten okay so now we got ten of those right and we can see that I can so this is always in this case it's right schema dot table dot column. Now it turns out you can go one level higher. You can actually do the database if you want to. So you well. can do select pg air dot postgres air dot account dot login from pg air dot postgres air dot account limit. And, and limit, by the way, is just saying I only want 10 rows in this case um, from my table so that I don't end up returning all 200,000 or whatever there are in there. OK, so I could do that. Now, here's an interesting thing. If I connect to my David Cohn database, right, you might think that if I connected there, I could do the same thing. I could run the same query. And it would work because now I've specified the database. You can't. The and 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 so this tells like this there there is another layer of abstraction, right? We talked about databases and how you can see them in, inside of it and what Postgres calls a cluster, right? And cluster is also horribly named, like it's another one of these things where it means like six dif six different things at least. But uh, the collections, the collection of databases inside of one essentially postmaster process. Uh, that that manages them. Um, that's what a database is in Postgres. One way, and, and part of the reason that the SQL standard has this there is that there was this thing called cross database references that some databases allow, some database management systems allow. Um, it, it, it doesn't work in Postgres. So there are different ways that you can do that. We use foreign data wrappers and other sorts of things where you can do those sorts of cross database references if you want to. However, we still allow this dot notation to exist because there are some um, tools that automatically fill that in because other databases, you need to do that. You don't connect directly to a database. You connect to like the whole cluster and then you need to specify which database you want to talk to, I think. Um, or if you want to just be really specific and make sure you're getting the right thing. Um, so uh, anyway, most people don't do that. Um, just so you know, like you don't do this whole le level of uh, all the levels of abstraction here. Sure. Um, the reason that I wanted to show it is because sometimes you do see this. And so I just wanted you to know that it could exist, but it's always this like four things is the most that you can see, which is always database, database dot schema dot, uh, table dot column. Yeah. And you usually yeah. read it actually from the other side. So let's reconnect to the PG, uh, PG Air database. So again, slash C is connect. We're going to go to PG Air. So if I want to 
Um, I, I wouldn't usually do it this way. Usually I would just schema qualify the table and then refer to my columns because if I only have one table, I can do it that way. We also talked about last time you can use aliases. And if you have an alias here, you always have to use the alias in place of that. So if I say select, uh, we'll just say, what do we want to call this? We'll call, we'll, we'll alias the account table as A. We can say A dot login from Postgres air dot account as A, as A, right? So that's our alias. And by the way, this as entirely optional, I can also do that way without the as. So sometimes you'll see it that way. Um, as a limit 10. So this is more likely what you'd see where the um, table name is schema qualified and then the column, whatever columns you want, you're just going to do with an alias or something like that. So that's typically how you see this type of SQL query written. Just useful for to know for reading this sort of stuff. Okay, so that's awesome. Um, we've learned a little bit more about uh, schema qualification. Um, I think uh, the next thing that we might want to know is a little bit more about this table. So when we when we just did this select star, right? Select star says, uh, and we can also do by the way a dot star. So a dot star says give me all the columns. It's a wild card and it works in SQL. Um, and then we see these columns and we see sort of what the data looks like in those columns. And that gives us a little bit of information, but if I want some more information on that, I might do slash DT Postgres air dot account. Much more information. What if I just did slash D? Just describe, I need some more information now. So you can see here, this is gonna give me some information about what the column, like what the columns are, their types, whether they're nullable, if there's a default. So um, we're going to go through and talk a little bit about what the what information this is giving you and sort of what it tells me. Um, and we're going to use some of the documentation also to, to learn a bit more about it. So one thing that you might see, oh, and by the way, yeah, no, let's 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 start with this. So um, okay, so when I'm reading this now, what do I see? Well, I see a column name. So you see the column names, that's really useful. I see my types. Um, so what is a type? What is it actually telling me here? Well, how would I find out something about that? Let's look in the Postgres documentation. Um, let's try to find out what we can about data types. So if I go to my browser, I want to find the Postgres docs. I can search maybe. Of course, I do this a lot. So that's, uh, uh, that's there. but. Postgres docs. So I, that, we include a, a link of it as well on the screen. So if you yeah. if it's hard to see the search bar, hopefully it's a little bit bigger. <laughs> I'm going notes. to go to the latest version. In general, whenever I go to the docs, I like to just go to the to the current, partially because if I'm going to ever share a link with someone, I always want to use that current link and not the link to the specific version, depending on what I'm trying to share about. Um, if, if it's something that's version specific, then I would use the specific version. But if I'm just trying to share something more general than I would use current. Um, and is this big enough? Should I make it bigger? If you can make it a little bit bigger, that might be helpful. Yeah, I feel okay. like that's good. Great. Uh, okay, so so we see this and, and we've just sort of got a lot of stuff. And so this table of contents, I find somewhat useful, um, especially a couple of sections. Um, one, especially for new folks, the tutorial is actually pretty nice. I would say, that, you know, and and the preface can be can be somewhat useful. The conventions part, really helpful, and like, I don't think many people read it, but it's actually, and, and I wish that we had uh, like links back to it. But if you're ever going through some of the um, like actual examples, um, knowing what the vertical lines and the dots and the braces. Um, what each of them means and what what that is conveying to you, really helpful. So conventions, really nice. Um, and whenever you do this, you get into a, a the, the section that you want. Um, to, uh, yeah, not always easy to navigate, but that's fine. Um, so back back here, um, 
And you might see that as I, as I uh, go in here, there's actually a section called data types in the table of contents here. So that's probably what I want. And I will say that the two sections that I use most frequently are data types and functions and oper operators in the docs. For me, those are the things that I end up referring to most often. And then I often will go in, uh, the other thing that I'll, I'll have is like the SQL commands. Like I will go into the individual commands um, and look for them either by going through here or you know, if I want to just remember the the syntax, right? And this is where knowing what what all those braces and brackets and other stuff means are really really helpful. Um, so that's just to say, there's a couple of useful things here that, uh, at least for me, I find data types, functions, and operators. Um, those are really really helpful portions of the docs. It's helpful to to read through a lot of the other stuff. But the ones that I refer most often to, and it's probably just partially based on what I'm doing with the database, right? So don't take this as gospel, um, are those two. I find them the most useful. So if I go into data types, um, we have this, this whole list of lots of different data types. Turns it's out a lot that of data types that I want, because we were looking at integer, right? Happens to be first, numeric data types. Um, and we see integer types is right here. So that's so 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 and and you also see by the way some of the other things so we have these serial data types and it turns out so and you'll see that the serial data type actually is an integer type and you'll note that account ID is actually a serial type it shows up as an integer because that's what it actually is as a data type but you see this uh, so if i created and, and we did this last time actually we had a serial as uh, as 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 one of our things, but the way that you can identify a serial type inside of this is actually to look at the default, and you'll see that it it calls next val, which is a function of the sequence. So the way that the serial type is implemented is that there's a sequence of numbers that's always going up every time I get a new one. It increments by one, and then we get whenever I call next val. I just get the next next one of those and it automatically populates. So that's how the serial type works. Um, but its base type is integer, and that's what happens to show up here. I'm not sure that that's always that's not always true with other other types that are sort of derived. We can talk more about that. Um, but uh, for this one, that's what that looks like. So that serial type it looks like that. Um, integers are an interesting type. So an integer is right whole numbers. Tells us that. And so that is to say, right, numbers without fractional components. So there's actually some really nice, I think, descriptions here, right? I would have trouble if it were just me describing what an integer is to someone who didn't know, but I think that that's actually a pretty good definition. So good job, Postgres Docs. Um, um, uh, <laughs> I should use that next time that I'm like, because I, I I used to teach mathematics. And yeah, it's some. It can be really tough to describe. It's really tough because these <laughs> things that are like, it's just like, oh man, this is so. Like I just use this so often, I can't. Like okay, yeah. So how do I define it in a way that like is useful to someone? I hope that's useful for folks. Um, anyway, uh, so that's good. Um, note that there are different uh, uh, different types of integers. So you'll see small int, in, uh, integer, big int. Um, you can also call that int. Um, and if I want to know, so uh, if I want to know what what something is, um, well, the other thing that, that you'll note here, and, and this is a, a useful thing to note here, is that they they're aliased again to other names, specifically for integers, right? Int two, int four, and int eight, and the two, four, and eight there are the size in bytes of the on the the the, the representation of the integer. So sort of like if you've ever programmed in C or some other languages, they have like an int 64 or an int 32 or an int 16. Um, that's in bits. So the corresponding thing in C, right? So an int 64 would be an int 8, and an int 16 would be an int 2, an int 4 would be an int 32. Um, so the bits to bytes things, they just, they in, in Postgres, they use bytes, useful to know. Um, they do have ranges. And you'll see here, right, what these ranges are for each of the uh, the types of integers um, for essentially how many numbers they can represent. So 
Um, in general, I tend to just use big ints because I'm not that worried about storage space in many of these cases. Um, there's other things that are going to take up more storage. So if I'm ever generating an ID or something like that, I just go straight to big serial um, because it's a heck of a lot harder to change later. Um, if you ever, you know, end up burning through your your serials, then uh, you know this this gives you a lot of room uh, to work with. So. Um, if you had yeah. more than that many rows of data in one table, I'd be a little bit concerned. I mean, it's possible, but <laughs> it is possible. Uh, yeah, like <laughs> you have bigger problems there. <laughs> good luck. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't even know. I mean, like that is so. That's that's a really it's, that's a lot of this billions, values. trillions. <laughs> that's whatever quadrillion. That's yeah. I don't I don't sex sex. Tillion, maybe I don't know. I can never remember a lot. <laughs> a lot. If you get that far, good luck. Um, so anyway, uh, let's let's go back. Um, so okay, so we we sort of know a little bit about type, like there are integer types, there are text types. Let's look a little bit more at types though, just so that we know one thing that that I find annoying about the docs, honestly, uh, is there's this type conversion section here. Um, and it's horrible. Like it's horrible to understand for a beginner anyway. It's very useful maybe for people who are, have more advanced cases, but for um, a beginner, there are just like a couple important things that I think you should know about types um, or, or, or type conversion. Um, and it strikes me that they don't really tell you that. And instead they're going into a lot of detail, which is very useful about how the planner understands types and other sorts of fun stuff. So don't look here for, for that. I'm gonna show you a little bit of that. Um, and what I really wanna talk about is casting because you'll see this sort of all the time. So um, one thing that you should know is that I can just, I don't have to select from a table. I can, I can always just select a scalar value. So if I wanna get the value one or, 1,365, right? I can just do that and it'll show up, right? Um, if I want to know, I can also cast that to a specific type if I want to. So I can say select cast. Ooh, that's fun. Cast 1,365 as um, big int. And it shows up then as an int eight, right? That's a big int. Um, and uh, but uh, the other way that I can say cast is I can say select one three six five, and this double colon is another way of of casting. And so you'll see that a lot. So I can say and I can cast then to big int. So just in case you ever want to know what that that little thing is that double colon is a cast statement and it tells like Postgres is strongly typed. You need to have some sort of type for everything. It really uses that a lot. We'll try to infer types in certain cases. So if you want to know what the type of something is, you can also use a function called PG type of. Yeah, I feel like and I often can get burned by typing like data type and you know some some functions not working and I'm like, yep. what's going on? <laughs> it's like, yeah. just use a different data type and then it's fine. <laughs> totally. Um, so this PG type of is important. Um, it helps us understand. So if I want to know also the type of a column, I could do the PG type of it. It'll run on every row though. So if I if it's a PG type of. So I have a question. If you do it on a, uh, um, on a value that's type serial will it show you the integer or will it show you like it did for the table definition or we'll, description we'll do integer well, well we can okay. see we can try this in fact I'm i was just curious because, uh, <laughs> it's going to run this on every row so you'll see that it that they're all integers um so pg type of i find is more useful when you're thinking about scalars or when you're thinking about whatever like you, you don't want to run it on every row it, it might be useful in some cases but un unusually so i do find it useful for de debugging things as well um like so for instance if i when i'm thinking about scalars right if i if i have 1365 like this it's going to be different than if i have it in single quotes in which case it's going to treat it as well in this case unknown right uh but if i i think that if i do 
unknown, still unknown. Okay, so unknown is an interesting data type where it's like, I don't actually know what this thing is because it's just random input. So I might have to cast it to text. And by the way, if you try to cast it to something that it can't be cast to, it will throw an error, right? If I say, if I want to cast that text string to an integer, like it's not going to not gonna work, right? Invalid, invalid syntax, right? So that's some useful stuff to know, I think, about types. Um, unknown is this special one where it's really, when it's trying to understand input, um, uh, it doesn't quite know at first. So often you'll see that people actually do explicit casts like this so that you know exactly what type um, is coming in. Uh, so something like that, we'll, we'll, we'll actually say text. Cool. Um, and that might be the same thing. So I could also, I think, Right. I can cast something that is in single quotes like this um, to text, and that, that works fine. I can also cast this, though, to big int, int or whatever, and it will do that because it is a valid input syntax. So there's always a text representation of something in SQL that I can use to cast to that type um, because all input is sort of plain text by default. So casting types, fun. Um, I, I think so. so when we were looking at this table, um, I just wanted to say one other thing, which is going back to our, uh, so so when we looked at our account table, right, we had all of these types. And I said, I could select um, a star from that and I would get, right, so select uh, a dot star from uh, Postgres air dot account a limit 10. Right, and that gives me all of the types. There's one other thing that's that's kind of cool about Postgres, um, and this gets into some object relational properties, which are interesting, and we can talk about more some sometime later when we get into uh, more theory stuff. But I can always actually refer to the table by its alias or by its name and get the composite type that makes it up. So. What does that mean? Let me just show you quickly. Select A from Postgres air dot account A. That gives me that row, right? All put together into one thing. And if I want to get out a specific column from that, whenever I have a specific type like this, this composite type, I can always do the same sort of dot notation, but I have to do something special with it. I have to actually wrap. So actually, first off, what kind of type is this? That's the first thing that I want to know. So we're going to use PG type of. So one thing that you'll note here is that we, when, whenever we create a table, we're going to automatically create a, a type that goes with it, and it's usually going to have the same name and 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 this is uh, something interesting that that I, I just think is 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 useful to know about how Postgres works internally is is this special type thing that that's going on here. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, you get a, you get some really special stuff going on with that. So this is a composite type, right? That's because it's made up of these different fields, and I can refer to those fields by name if I want to. Um, so if I want to get out a specific field, what I do is I just wrap that A in parentheses, so I can leave it wrapped, and then I use my dot notation. So whenever I have this special composite type, I can always use dot notation to get stuff back out. That's how I can, or I can do a, but I can also treat it like a column if I want to as well. So, um, and and that's something that that will come up later. Like I can I can actually use it in joins if I ever wanted to join on the entire record for some reason. Um, so there there are interesting things that you, that you can do there. This is a fun thing with composite types. I think it's a useful thing to know that types and tables actually sort of go together. They're linked in Postgres in an interesting way. So that's types and and, and other sorts of stuff discussion um, and and. Just something useful to know about that. Uh, it can be really nice in certain cases to just return the whole row. Um, there are also some like fun 
functions that you can use, like for to to like I can use for instance, uh, select row to JSON, I think. Yeah, I'm, I was curious, like for the rows that uh, or the 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 way that it's formed, you know, almost like an array. Can you like mm -hmm. unnest it and create like go from a row so, to a column? Yes. So yes, that's that's yeah, what I would, that would you. be okay. And that would be if if I so for instance you're, you're you maybe you're asking if I so if I were to do this in ACTE in this case so with uh, foo as um, so if I then say select star from foo I get that composite type back if I want to go back from that I have to actually wrap that composite type in. Um, parentheses, and then I can dot notate to get it, the individual columns out if I want to. So um, I can do lesson, uh, or uh, not lesson, what was it? Uh, it was uh, login. I want to get login. And I can do multiple things. So I can say a dot login, uh, a, a dot account ID. Um, and you'll note here that once once it's actually being treated as a type, I can't do this. Because it doesn't know that that's a table anymore. It just knows that as the composite type, it's it's actually the column name now. So just a useful thing to know. Um, it's it's sort of advanced and weird, but just just something to know about Postgres. It's it's fun. I think it's a it's it's something that comes in handy for me, and I think that also like sort of blows people's minds when I show them sometimes. Uh, so and I think th this may end up running a little bit long because we're already at fifty minutes and. I haven't even gotten through. Well, whatever. Well, uh, if it runs a little long, it runs a little long. Fine. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, speed it up. Uh, wa watch it at, at 1.5x, and we'll still take you an hour. Uh, anyway, I probably talked too fast for that. At least my mom would tell me that. So, uh, going back to sort of what we're we're thinking about here, um, let's go back and look at our table definition again. So, uh, slash d. Account. Okay, so we see all of these. So we see some things down here, by the way. We see some things about indexes. We think, see things about foreign key constraints and referenced by. We may or may not get to some of that here. Um, we might want to look at that at some point. But right now, I want to also just look at this other column here, which is nullable. I don't want to get into collations today. Collations are horrible. Um, they they determine sort orders. So if you're ever wondering what they are, they determine sort orders. But I'd recommend going and reading the docs about collations if you want to learn more. They're like anyway. The basic gist is that if you're if you're if you have a dictionary in Russian versus a dictionary in English, or a dictionary in Chinese, or a dictionary in French, uh, French, French they have different orderings of of letters, and you might want to sort it according to whatever ordering you want. Um, and that that helps tell you what it is. By default, it's this default one, which is why that there's nothing here in this column, because we just use the default collation, which I think for me is ENUS. So if you don't speak English, I'm sorry that my ordering's off. Um, we also see, by the way, this timestamp type. We see this text type. One thing to note: I almost always use text. Don't use any of the their care types. Um, I tend to hate them. Uh, there's some valid reasons for it. We can go over that more another time. For now, let's let's talk about nulls. Because nulls are another thing that comes up fairly frequently. So what is what is something being null or not null telling me? Well, there are a few things. So what does null mean? Does anyone have an idea of what null means? The absence of something, <laughs> of anything. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So it, it actually is kind of like that unknown, right? So like, um, uh, it's kind of like that, like unknown. So let's. Let's look at what uh, if I do. Man, oh, sorry, I'll be right back. I'm just gonna my shade. The sun is blinding me whenever I look over here. Um, okay, hopefully I'll be less blinded now. Um, yeah, you, you have to do what I did, but because I remember I was like hardcore blinded the other stream day, and I got like a panel to put in front of my window. <laughs> Well, I like the light normally, and it's nice and warm. Like, yeah, especially yeah. When See, it's that's like why a it's removable great. panel. You know, it's just like <laughs> just take it down. It's like <laughs> I think it's actually insulation. <laughs> um. Anyways. Anyway. Uh, nulls. So, nulls. 
select. So if I say select null, and I can cast it, say, so null as an integer, um, it's this sort of value that doesn't actually exist. And that's what null is saying is like, it could or it couldn't exist. Um, or really null is saying the value is unknown. It's not specified. Um, it's also saying whether like, and when I'm thinking about it in a schema definition, what this is telling me is that if I look over here, right, account ID is required. So that's it says it can't be null, so I have to specify it. Login is required. I, it can't be null, I have to specify it. Same with first name and last name. But frequent flyer ID is nullable. Now, why might that be? Well, if I have, uh, I can book a ticket without being a frequent, having a frequent flyer number for, for, for the airline, right? But I do need to have a login maybe because that's just, you know, that it's the only way I could have booked my ticket at all. So the frequent, like the frequent flyer ID is nullable as in I may or may not have it. Whereas account ID is required. So it's not null. And we talk about these, this, this as a constraint so you'll see these this word constraint here in a number of different cases. Now these constraints, in this case, these constraints are are telling us something about how it uh, looks at it in, in a different table. It's it's a foreign key constraint. So it's saying it exists over here, right? So the constraints say that might say that that it's between two tables, uh, but in some cases we can also have a not null constraint, and that sort of constraint is it's really just saying the data has to follow this pattern. So a not null constraint says this uh, column has to be provided. And in fact, you can see if I have a not null constraint, if I try to do an insert into count, um, and well, actually, let's go back to our, I think we, we had some values here. So we could actually take this, maybe. Uh, I don't know if that's going to work. Uh, eh. uh, I, I'm Honestly, I'm going to leave this as an exercise for the user. If I were to insert into that, I don't want to form the, the statement right now. It's just going to take me too long uh, typing. Um, so we'll, we'll deal with that later. But if I were to try to insert it and I had a null in one of these columns, it would block. It would say, sorry, I can't do that unless it has a default, right? And in this case, so I can leave the account ID out because that one has a default. And it's it's the default is the next val. So the other thing that you should know about nulls is that if I'm ever selecting uh, with a where clause and I wanna know, so why don't we select where, uh, I mean, one thing that we might wanna know is, is frequent flyer ID actually ever null, right? That might be a question that I would ask about this data as I'm exploring this table in particular, like, or does everyone have a have an account ID? So I might want to ask about where um, uh, frequent flyer ID is null or not. And one thing that you'll notice normally when we do this, right, we say, okay, select star from uh, Postgres error account um, where use a where clause. And if I wanted to get like where account ID equals 200, I don't know if this exists, right? I would just say equals 200. And look, there is someone with an account ID 200. That's great. Um, so, but what if, so what about a nullable field? Do I say uh, select where, um, uh, what is that called, frequent flyer ID? And actually, the one that you just chose, you got lucky. It's null already. It is null. So <laughs> yeah. Um, but what if I wanted to see if there was a frequent flyer ID equals two hundred? Look, there is a frequent flyer ID that's two hundred. So that's equals. But then if I if if this is a nullable column, what about if I just want it where it equals null? So do I just say equals null? We just saw that there was this one that was null. So what's going on there? Well, so let's think about this for a second. So select, um, and remember we can cast, so we can say null, 
colon colon it's an integer um, equals null. The results null. If I say select 200 equals 200, the results true, right? Um, and if I say it's 201 or 202, it's false. Null is treated as false in, in a where clause. And the thing about null comparisons, and if I do something like null equals 200, right, it's also still unknown. Because you really can't say where unknown equals 200. Like, it just, it, it's actually sort of a fallacy to do equality with null, because two unknown things aren't necessarily equal. So whenever we're working with nulls, we have to use is. Select null int is, or actually in this case we say is distinct from say it's so so we use this is distinct from or is not distinct from. to talk about equality when we're talking about nulls. So we say that these two unknown values, well, they're not distinct from each other because they're both null, but they're not exactly equal either. So we use that whenever we're, so whenever we, whenever we write a where clause with it, right? We don't use equals, we instead say is. We'll get a lot of stuff there. Um, or is not, and we're gonna add a limit now because again, I. Right, so we can use is null and is not null to do this. So is not null gives us all the, the non-null values um, and uh, is null gives us all of the null values. Um, we can also like do counts uh, and, and see if they're equal. There's all sorts of fun stuff that we could do to, to figure out. So I might say, well, how much of it is null? So I could say select count are um, as total comma count star and we'll do a filter don't go over exactly what that is where uh, frequent flyer ID is null as null. Out. So we see that like the total here is uh, 250 something thousand and the number of nulls is 128,000. It seems like it's about half where they're null. Um, I mean, this is also something where like it's a generated data set. So you'd probably expect that to be actually almost exactly half uh, given various things. But um, so this is just like some of the ways that I might interact with this data set, right? But even just coming up with those questions that you want to ask. Now, um, so we, we learned about not null constraints. There are other types of constraints as well. So there's things like a unique constraint. So let's look at this again, slash D, uh, describe again, uh, describe Postgres error count. Right, so we, what else might we learn about this? Well, when I look at this, I see account ID is a primary key. So we might know that a primary key is a unique identifier. So it's it's unique. It has to be unique. Okay. What about login? Should login be unique? I wonder if it is. Right. So that's another question that I might ask about this. Um, and so I might say something like select count again star as total count. Uh, distinct, and then I might use account distinct login as ones from, and that will do a count. So this one gives me the total count. This one gives me the the count of the distincts, and this will tell me if my logins are are unique. If they're if these are two are the same, then I'll know that my emails or whatever is in login um, are all all unique. 
And now this is going to take a little bit longer because now it has to actually compare all the different rows to each other and it has to build a table around that. And you'll note, okay, these, these two things are the same. So that means that logins are in fact unique. So that's cool. That's good to know. I mean, you can also see like, by the way, that, that if I did this on account ID, that would also be true. Um, right, and that's a lot faster. Why? Because it used an integer rather than text. Um, so useful things to know about some of this stuff, just like ways that I would go about exploring this data. Um, so one thing that I wonder about here as I'm looking at this is why isn't there a unique constraint on login? That's one of the things that I would do. Why would I do that? Well, constraints are there. So someone might not have a have a unique constraint on login, and they might not have it because they expect that their application is always going to go and look up by login first. Right? So, and if it finds it, then it's going to use it. So I don't need to worry about it too much because I always look it up first. The thing about your database is to me, these constraints and all of these things are really there to make sure that your assumptions about what the app is going to do aren't violated. So don't end up accidentally because someone has a bug in their code or something like that, end up making a new account for someone with the same email because they followed some weird code path that accidentally didn't look up the, the email first. And now they have two accounts. They're both associated with the same email. And whenever they log in, everything gets confused. Right, So I could create a unique constraint here in order to help avoid that. That's one of the things that um, a constraint on a table does, like a unique constraint on a table. The database serves as, as your backstop. It's your source of truth, and it's a way to enforce certain things on the data. And so that's what a lot of these constraints and other sorts of things in the relational model do, is they help maintain your data integ integrity, even if someone writes an app that has a bug in it or whatever else, um, that's what some of these constraints can help you really do and, and, and be really good about it. So that's the, that's sort of, um, I think that that covered a fair amount. Um, we've, we've, we're now at a bit about, about 10 minutes over. Um, one thing actually I see in the chat that, uh, someone put in VUM today. I don't know exactly what that means, but there's a dot there. And I think they might be saying something about, uh, uh, identifiers, because this is something that can screw people up a little bit uh, too. Um, so you'll notice that none of this is case sensitive, uh, right? I can recapitalize this. I can do, uh, or here, uh, oh, I can, I can do Postgres, right? And it's going to do the same thing. Of course, in this case, it, I chose the wrong one because it's the one that takes forever. Um, but it gets the same thing. It doesn't matter what my capitalization is. Now, there's this convention that we usually use keywords as capital, and most other things are lowercase. Um, I don't always follow that. Sometimes I just write everything lowercase. Um, but so case sensitivity is an important thing. There are some cases where I might want to create a table Um, with those capitals mattering. So I might want to, like, if, if my app uses camel case, um, and uh, it'll be, I don't know, uh, ID int. Um, oh, cool. It's just a spam link. I thought it was a question. We're taking it. We're, we're even learning from spam links today. Uh, great. Um, uh, uh, so we're going to create this table at ID and maybe it has another column name, uh, camel column, uh, text, right. Uh, and so if I wanted to do that and I wanted that to matter, you'll note that if I, uh, slash DT, uh, slash D, uh, right you'll note that it automatically lowercased it for me. It just treats it all as the same. If I want that to actually matter, I need to wrap it in double quotes. 
and this will be now a different table, right? So whenever I have an identifier, I want to be treated specially like this. I wrap it in double quotes, um, sort of like when we did text, we uh, text values, we use single quotes. Um, you can do double quotes to do identifiers like this. Um, and then we have a new table. If I do this, I get the old one. But if I then put it in double quotes, new one. And you'll see now if I just do slash D T, um, that ca both camel case and camel case exist. They're different things. So that was just a, that's just another thing that came up. Uh, are there any good case we, formatters? For, oh yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. Miranda, please. Oh no no no! I mean you you were gonna read. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question. <laughs> yeah. Are there any good case for matters for dbver to enforce consistency? And that is a good question. And I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't know, know of a good formatter. I think there are some SQL formatters. I've used some in the past um, that that have some more opinionated things around uh, like the, the the formatting of SQL and making sure that you actually use double quotes, making sure that you use, uh, you know, all of your keywords are, um, you know, like if I do select and someone else does select, that those will be converted into one standard way of doing things so that it's easier to read. Um, uh, that's a good question. I, I, maybe I can look into that for you. Um, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. I haven't really used them. I usually just, mm. um, but, but honestly, it would be helpful for me too. I think that, that would be nice. Yeah. Um, I know there are some linters that do this stuff, but I can't, I, I don't remember the name off the, off the top of my head, David. So, uh, but thank you for the question. Um, it's a good one. Anyway, our uh, spam question that wasn't actually a question, but led us to an important discussion anyway. And our real question that was a great question um, uh, that I didn't know the answer to. Are there any other questions that maybe uh, will uh, be more useful? Otherwise, I think what we can end. Um, cool. Well, I hope that that was that was useful for everyone, um, and and I hope that that was that was good. Um, let us know uh, if there's anything else. We, we're gonna post, I think, a forum link so you can ask some questions about this there. You can ask in the comments below the YouTube uh, page if you want. Um, uh, if you have any other questions to follow up there, we're also going to, like I said, that forum is also where you can discuss things like the homework. If you have any good questions to ask about the Postgres Air data, or if you wanted to post some other publicly available data sets, or if you have a data set you want to share, um, you know, we'd love to do that. Uh, we'll put a forum link in the eventual, like eventually in the YouTube uh, yeah. comments so that you can go and, and, and uh, you know, post there if you have questions or anything else. Uh, and we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, same time, uh, slightly Get different it on your calendar. Um, <laughs> but would love to have you back and, uh, hopefully, hopefully you're finding this useful. We'll probably go into some more, I think we're going to go back to some conceptual stuff for next time, but I, I don't guarantee it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure which, which way we're going to go right now. So, um, uh, probably going to talk about indexes and constraints and go a little bit deeper on that. Uh, should today. be awesome. So, Hope that's helpful. Let us know if there's anything else you want to want to cover and see you later. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. We will see you in two weeks. Same time. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.